Okay, hello everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for joining us for the pre-conference workshop on learner corpus research that'll be occurring today as part of the eighth annual symposium on language research at UC Davis. Um, so today we have events from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, Pacific time in the US. Um, I'm sorry, I know everyone's coming from all around the world. So please convert that time to your local time. Um, but just as an overview of the events today, uh, we have this wonderful Corpus Creator panel this morning and then a paper session at 9.30 with a 15 minute break between them. Those will both be on Zoom. And then we're gonna actually come back to um, a hybrid in-person format at 11 for Dr. Um, Nicole Tracy Ventura's keynote presentation at the Student Community Center. Um, so I hope you all can join us for that, be it on Zoom or in person. We'll have lunch followed by an error annotation workshop led by a team from Universidad de Salamanca. And then we'll have our second paper session followed by our poster session. And we do also have our posters on our YouTube channel. Um, I would very much recommend everybody to please check those out. I'm gonna drop that link in the chat. Um, and so we would love for you all to um, write comments on those YouTube videos, um, you know, giving feedback, giving questions on um, the posters that those students created. Um, and then I'm also going to provide the link to our website as well. Um, and so there's more information there about the program, which you all should have received when you registered. Um, but certainly feel free to also email me, ask me if you have any questions or concerns. Um, I'm so grateful to everyone on the planning committee for making this event happen. So thank you so much to Paloma Fernandez Mira and to Claudia um, Sanchez Gutierrez, as well as the planning committee um, for the larger symposium event. This really would not have been possible without all of your hard work. Um, so thank you for your dedication. Um, and I wanna go over some Zoom etiquette as well before we begin. Um, so I know, you know we've been through this for two years now, um, but just remember please to uh, stay muted unless you are speaking. Please do not share your screen unless it is your time to do so. Um, and please refrain from posting any inappropriate content. We want this to be a really wonderful event um, and a great learning experience. Okay. Um, so I am going to turn it over to Claudia to introduce the panelists. Before I do that, I'm just gonna share this campus, uh, campus map of UC Davis if you're joining us in person. Um, but without further ado, Claudia. So hello everyone, good morning or good evening, depending on where you're in the world. I'm really excited to be, to see in the chat how many people are coming from all over the world. This is really, really exciting for us. So thank you so much for joining. So basically we are here um, to talk about Corpus the whole day, but this morning is particularly special to us. So learner Corpus research has traditionally been limited uh, to the study of English as an additional language, which does not really represent all the breadth of languages that people are learning around the world. Um, so in order to highlight some work that is currently being done in other languages, we decided to invite researchers involved in the creation of some major corpora that all share the fact that they are not documented English learners output, but who also offer, um, um, yeah, but focus on other languages. Uh, but also each of the corpora, uh, corpora has like very unique characteristics, which is what we want to be talking about today. So the corpora represented today will be um, the muscle corpus, which is a corpus from the University of Utah that compiles spoken language produced by learners of six foreign languages, Chinese, Russian, Portuguese, Spanish, French, and German. Sedel Dos is uh, a corpus that collects, well, I say mostly because now there is some oral, but mostly written samples from learners of Spanish from all over the world with up to 11 different L1s ranging from Greek to Chinese. Uh, COWS L2H offers um, data from students of Spanish as a second language enrolled in Spanish courses at one single university here at 
UC Davis. Um, and finally, LangSnap uh, has this wonderful corpus that looks into the development of learners of Spanish and French during, after, um, yeah, before, during, and after they participate in a study abroad program. So really each corpus has very their very own characteristics, which is really cool and they can be very complementary in ways. And so the aim of this panel is to get to know how these corpora have been created, what they bring to the conversation, the challenges we find in creating these corpora and how as learner corpus creators, we can learn from each other and potentially collaborate um, with this work we are doing. And so I will proceed to ask uh, three questions, but in three rounds. So first we'll go for question one, the different groups will answer, then we go to question two, different groups answer, then question three, and only at the very end we will take uh, questions from the audience. Um, so if you want to share questions during the talk in the chat, that's fine, I will just take them all at the end and then read them out loud, or if you want to you prefer to wait until the end and then just unmute yourself and ask a question that's perfectly fine too. Um, so, okay, let's proceed with uh, question one. So question was is actually a couple questions. Um, basically what we want is each of you to present your corpus. So questions would be, what is the corpus structure? What do you feel are the strongest affordances for research offered by your corpus? What do you feel particularly proud of? And then the, the third part is like, if you could start from scratch basically and redesign your whole corpus, what would you do similarly and what changes would you make, if any, and why? So let's start in the order I presented everyone. So let's start with the, the team, the Utah team. Hi everyone, nice to meet you. Uh, this is Elna Kia. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the um, Second Language Teaching and Research Center at the University of Utah, and I represent MUSO. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see the platform. So before I start, I'm gonna say <laughs> something about uh, access to MUSO. Uh, the reason I haven't um, shared the um, link uh, to Muscle with everyone right here, I mean, I can, but um, so right now, access to Muscle is closed because we are reaching agreements with Actful, the um, company or organization that is providing us with the data. Um, so we had to make some changes with the copyrights and um, access. Um, so hopefully very soon we'll open uh, the corpus again and you'll hear from us um, in our social media uh, pages. Okay, so um, what is Muscle? Muscle is a multilingual corpus of second language speech. Um, it represents um, currently five languages, but eventually six languages, so including Chinese, French, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish. This is um, what the user um, interface looks like. And uh, so here are our filters. These are the languages that I said. In front of each language, uh, language you see the number of files um, that are currently available in this version of the corpus. And um, another fact is that the samples or text in Muscle come from two um, main learning contexts from adult and child. And these texts were um, extracted from, uh, like these are test um, samples from uh, like two testing or assessment situations with the, uh, with the child um, language samples. They all come from the APPLE test uh, from ACTFL. APPLE uh, stands for ACTFL uh, Assessment of Performance Toward Proficiency in Languages. And uh, so these are children in grades three to 10. And then the adult samples come from the OPIC test or oral proficiency interview by computer. And uh, we have um, like, um, like gender information about the child samples. And then we also, for each uh, sample, you'll get the proficiency level of um, the learner. Um, so these are the adult proficiency levels you see. Um, so we have um, 
ACTFL rating scale and then um, the OPEC ILR rating scale. And then um, the child proficiency level. So of course we have the Apple rating, the original rating that each student receives. And then um, we have the corresponding um, CFR rating. Um, um, so that's great information that you can get by um, downloading the spreadsheet of the entire corpus. Uh, this is good for those of you who uh, are not quite familiar with Apple, but work mainly with the CFR uh, framework. And then, uh, so you can also uh, like adjust the filters um, regarding the grade level. And also we have um, topics. So for each uh, text sample, we have uh, like in, in the text, we have information about the topic uh, of the, um, the text. And yeah, and uh, on this page, you have the option to download the spreadsheet of the entire corpus. And um, we also are uh, recording the versions uh, that you're releasing. So this way we can keep track, okay, who used what version and, um, you know, so that it's reproducible. Um, okay, um, I think that's it. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, do Fernando, maybe you want to add something or we just proceed to the next? Do you want us to go through A, B, and C, the, the, the sub questions within? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. so um, you wanted us to talk about the, the affordances um, for, for research and what we are most proud of. Um, and I think Elna's described the, the diversity within the corpus. We have adult data, we have children data, we have different uh, contexts of learning represented. So some of the adults learn by immersion abroad, some learn in the classroom. Children are um, enrolled in dual language immersion programs, what in other parts of the world are known as bilingual programs. We have different, of course, ages represented, uh, pretty wide variety of languages. So um, that gives you the ability to compare um, and of course, we have official proficiency ratings for all of them. So it gives you the, the ability to compare, for example, what does an intermediate learner look like who learned by immersion in country compared to someone who learned in the classroom? Or what does an adult intermediate learner look like compared to a child intermediate learner? What are the, the similarities and differences between the two? Um, Additionally, it gives us the, the ability to um, engage in significant uh, longitudinal research because we get the data, uh, particularly the, the, the child data, we get it from the state of Utah uh, and the state tests these students every single year. So we have multiple instances of the same learner being tested over a period of time. So if we wanted to look at the uh, development of proficiency, for example, from the very low level of proficiency, starting with a third grade sample and follow a particular child until he or she gets to 12th grade, we have the ability to do that, which is amazing, right? We have access to the same person over a long period of time. Um, and we always have um, external uh, proficiency ratings. Uh, rated by a third party. So it's not a test that we develop to determine the level of proficiency. We're not determining the level of proficiency based on the course that they're enrolled in. It is officially rated by a third party. Anything else, Elna? Uh, yeah, I'll add uh, like about the part C of the question. Um, so we thought that something that was important is like the piloting stage. So if we had to do it um, again, uh, we would have taken more time on the piloting stage and like administering um, surveys or like doing focus groups um, like with the public uh, with the uh, pilot data to um, get professionals opinions. Uh, this will, you know, help you along the way as you're building your corpus like later on you don't need as many uh, to make as many changes, uh, you know, to the whole corpus. Um, and I'm talking about the coding, annotations, um, things like that. 
Uh, and one more thing that I forgot to mention is that we the texts in our corpus are um, each text has um, is represented in three formats: uh, chat, uh, which is using the clan program, and then um, text um, and also PDF. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let's uh, move on to Cedel Dos, Cristobal. Yeah, okay, so let me share the screen with you, please. Can you see that? Okay, so uh, good evening to everyone or good morning to most of you. And uh, this is uh, CEDEL2, which stands for uh, Corpus Escrito, del Español L2. This is the second version of the corpus. Uh, as I will say, uh, the corpus is mainly written, but there are also plenty of spoken data. So we have collected data from uh, learners with uh, 11 different backgrounds, you know, ranging from, uh, you know, uh, Germanic languages like English, German, Dutch, and so on, Romance languages as well, as you can see there, Japanese, Chinese, Arabic. We are expanding the corpus and we are collecting more languages so i will leave that for uh for the end and we are also for comparative purposes we are collecting um control corpora so we have data from l1 spanish native from uh spanish and latin american varieties also l1 english native japanese natives and so on. i will explain in a minute in a minute why uh these uh, like uh, you know uh, so many uh, control corpora here um i will show the interface later on towards the end but just to have a clear idea, let's see if it's working. Okay. Uh, here in the filters, you know, you can select uh, plenty of things. You can uh, select here, you know, filter the learners according to one or more L1s, for example, the median, the written, spoken, and uh, importantly, written and spoken by the same person. I will talk about this in a minute. We have different proficiency levels as well ranging from lower beginner to upper advanced and uh, near natives. We also have a placement test score in percentage, the self-assessment proficiency level, so learners self-rate themselves. Uh, we have uh, 13 past titles in here, so you can choose uh, narratives, argumentatives, uh, and, and so on. Uh, what else? The age, chronological age, also the age of exposure to Spanish. You can filter the data according to that. The years of studying Spanish, so that's uh, length of exposure and uh, length of residence, stay abroad in Spanish speaking countries. Okay. And then you can do different searches, but I will uh, show that a bit later. So the bottom line is that we have, uh, I mean, SEDEL2 so is defined by, by some researchers as a multi L1 corpus of L2 Spanish. So I think that's a very nice definition. Um, so 11 different L1 so far. And we have different native controls at corpora. The idea is to have a native control, control subcorpus for you know, each different learner corpus, all right? But, you know, so Delta is growing and for its third version, hopefully we will have all that. Um, we are designing two corpora in Granada, one called Corefo. This is an L2 English uh, corpus and also JFL Corp, an L2 Japanese corpus. And importantly, they all follow the same the same principles and methodology as Sedel 2 So you can make interesting uh, comparisons across the corpora. And Sedel 2 allows a very interesting typological contrast between the Germanic, Romance, Slavic languages, East Asian languages, and, and so on. Null subject versus non null subject languages, which is kind of like a classic topic of research in L2 acquisition. So far, we have 4,000, more than 4,000 participants. Uh, in the second version, we have only 111 audio files, but we are expanding. We are, we are collecting uh, many more. So we intend to expand the spoken component of CEDEL2. So CEDEL2 <laughs> will not be Corpus Escrito. It should be in, that, in the future Corpus Escrito y Oral. So maybe we will have to change the name at some point. We have 4,400 texts. And these are like written and spoken texts. And uh, in total, we have more than 1 million words. Um, the regarding the by control uh, uh, corpora uh, control, you know, we have for each learner subcorpus, 
we do have a native control corpus of the learner's mother tongue and also a native control corpus of the learner's target language. We still need to collect data from L1 German, Dutch, Italian, some languages, but the idea is to have, as I said before, a control corpus for each yeah, of the uh, um, learner corpora, let's say. Yeah. What else? Uh, I'll skip that. And the strongest affordance is for, for research. Well, I would say that uh, SEDEL2 has been designed according to uh, or based on, on second language acquisition. So we have collected the second language acquisition relevant uh, learner variables. And the idea uh, is that we can answer certain uh, questions. So for example, you know, uh, we have collected data for, from the age of, uh, age of onset or age of exposure, uh, the L1, obviously, some educational background variables, proficiency level variables, and so on. So all of these variables allow to answer some specific second language acquisition uh, questions like, you know, kind of like age effects and so on. Uh, regarding the tasks, we have 14 task types. So we have uh, argumentative, descriptive essays, narrative essays. Uh, when it comes to the task variables, we uh, control for the length uh, of, of the task, how long it took to do the task, the location, the resources uses, used for the task. So the aim is to test between task effects since uh, task type constraints the learners into language, and we know this by several studies. Okay. What else? Um, sorry, I'm rushing through um, uh, multiple L1 backgrounds, as I said, to test the effect of what is common to L1 versus what is, uh, you know, universal to all learners, uh, developmental effects. So, you know, you can uh, see developmental uh, profiles from lower beginner up to upper advanced. And we have even near natives as well. By model contrast. So the, this is an important new feature of SEDEL2. So uh, most participants do, uh, uh, sorry, uh, many participants do the same task in a writing and then in, in spoken format. So this is in, interesting because we can uh, test the effect of uh, modality and uh, we keep participant and uh, the task constant. So we can answer, you know, some classic questions in second language acquisition because, you know, that people say, well, you know, spoken corpora are better because they better reflect uh, learners into language. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure, sure about that. And uh, one of my colleagues, Ana Diaz Negrillo, and uh, some other PhD students are doing, you know, research on this uh, with our SEDEL2 data. What else? Bidirectionality thing, as I said. So we can compare SEDEL2 versus the uh, correctful corpus on L2 English, and also, you know, the, uh, uh, the kind of new corpus that we are collecting uh, on L2 Japanese JFL Corp. The idea of two native speaker control Corpora, this is very important because we can see, uh, you know, when learners produce certain errors, we can see whether those errors come from their L1 or whether they come from the language that they are learning that is Spanish or whether they are, you know, typical production of uh, interlanguage. I'll skip that. So um, I think that um, SEDEL2 can cater for second language acquisition researchers, yeah, but also for, you know, a different and a wider community of researchers like uh, curriculum developers, material writers, language testers, lexicographers, computational linguists as well, you know. It's funny because sometimes people will get in touch and say, well, I've just downloaded the, the corpus because I want to train the machine. So the, these are people working on with that natural language processing. Um, and uh, one of the sub questions was whether you are particularly proud of something. Well, you know, uh, I'm, the, I'm proud of the corpus design principles behind SEDEL2 and it's uh, second language acquisition motivated variables because they, they uh, can help researchers answer certain, you know, key questions. Also the comparability with the other similarly designed corpora, Corefl and JFL Corp, the size. You know, it's relatively large. And also, the, I'm, I'm proud of the web interface. You know, it took a long time to develop. Um, and another question uh, here was, if I could start from zero, what would I do? Well, I would do many different. Probably I wouldn't, I wouldn't start off collecting the corpus because, you know, it's a lot of work, actually. But if I could start off from zero, I would use a CFR-based uh, proficiency level test because uh, 
when I started collecting Sedel II back in 2005, 2006, there was no notion of uh, CFR uh, tests. Um, I would have included from the very outset more written and spoken data by the same person. This is something that we are doing now, and uh, it's very, very useful, actually. I would also include uh, dialogic tasks, you know, dialogues uh, in the spoken data. Um, and also including heritage uh, speakers. I mean, we do have some, you know, some heritage speakers have participated, but just by the very nature of the design of Sedel II, they are not included because, you know, you would need to redesign Sedel II in order to include certain variables that are typical of uh, heritage speakers. And, uh, and this is it, actually. All right. Thank you, Cristobal. Um, so we will move on to Chaos. So, Paloma. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me first share my screen. So I'm uh, I'm Paloma. I'm part of the Chaos H team. Um, and Chaos H, um, as you see here, is the UC Davis Corpus of Written Spanish of L2 and Heritage Speakers. So the name comes from that, not, not from the cows from Davis, which are also famous. Um, but as, it, as the name says, um, it contains samples of texts written by L2 learners and also heritage speakers that are enrolled in the UC Davis Spanish program. So the first texts um, were collected in 2017 and the data collection process is ongoing. We still, uh, we're still collecting data. Um, and so far, we have more than 5,000 texts, um, more than 1 million tokens, and close to 2,000 unique participants. Um, the learners that participate range from total beginners, which are enrolled in um, Spanish 1, to advanced users of Spanish that are involved in composition and upper division courses on linguistics and literature. Um, for a given data collection period, which is an academic quarter, we, we have quarters in, the, in this university, um, participants write to two open-ended prompts, one in week four and one in week eight of the quarter. Something very important to note is that Causal 2H was created with um, a general purpose in mind. So uh, it was created for the general use of researchers that have this SLA or uh, heritage language motivated questions about writing, as opposed to being created to answer like sp a specific um, research question. And here uh, we have the GitHub repository where we make um, all the data and metadata freely available. Um, you have to go down here to, to read um, the README document, um, which has a short description of the essays, essay prompts here. Um, famous vacation, these are the prompts, the topics that we give the, the students, the participants to write to. And also uh, you have a description of the metadata that we, um, that we collected so far. Um, also down here is um, a guide on how to download and process the files uh, in the CSV format. Um, so if we go up here to the actual repository, which is um, the, has the folders, the directories for, for actually each of the prompts uh, is organized by prompts because the prompts um, are going to be in our corpus the same regardless of the proficiency level of the participants. Um, for example, here we have the, the um, folder for the you, yourself prompt. Um, and in this, in this prompt, the participants were asked to write a description of themselves in week four of their respective courses. Um, and the same information that is included in these folders that have the name of the prompts, yourself, occasion, terrible, it's also in CSV format um, in this um, folder here. So CSV uh, is a format that is commonly used by researchers to organize and analyze their data. Um, so we can go to this directory here, the CSV directory, and uh, download the files that contain all the essays and metadata for a given prompt and also a, a given data collection period. So I'm going to show you one of them. I'm going to open the yourself winter. This is winter 21 quarter. Um, it's the file, you can see it like this, or you can also download it to your computer uh, following the guide that we have there. 
Um, and we can look at some of the data together. So here's the name of the prompt, the quarter, the course that the student is enrolled in, um, the, their age, gender, how many years um, this of Spanish they took before coming to UC Davis, which is the first course they took at UC Davis. Um, did they go to elementary school in a Spanish or an English speaking country? Uh, where did they go to high school? Did, um, how exposed are they to Spanish in their daily life? Their motivation to study Spanish? Um, a series of questions about how comfortable do they feel like understanding language, um, Spanish language in different contexts or speaking Spanish in different contexts, writing, and also a few questions about their uh, current course, how much they're enjoying the, their Spanish course at the moment. Um, and here, finally, we have the essays uh, for each of the participants. And of course, they are anonymized and we can see, um, can see what they write about themselves. Um, Right, so I think I'm gonna stop sharing for the, for the rest of the questions. Um, yeah, so uh, we have five aspects that, uh, of causal traits that we would like to, to especially highlight. Um, the first one is that, as I said, the prompts or the topics are consistent across courses or across levels. And this makes it possible to compare students at different proficiency levels without the interference of task variables. Um, the second one is that um, our corpus includes a good amount of longitudinal data. Since uh, number one, we ask participants to provide two samples per quarter, as I said. And also number two, uh, we encourage repeated participation as they progress through the Spanish coursework. For example, uh, right now we have more than 4,000 students that have participated in two quarters. Um, almost 200 in three quarters and 80 uh, in four or more quarters. Um, the third aspect is that we are proud to have collected a large learner corpus, um, although that brings its own downsides as I'll discuss in a, in a little bit. Um, number four, uh, because UC Davis has a series, series of courses for heritage speakers of Spanish, um, we are able to include them, include samples from, from this population as few other Spanish learner corpora can do. Um, and the last one is that the texts collected in Gausel 2H are written by students outside of a classroom context. They are not uh, class assignments or exams. Um, so the participants, instructors never read their essays. There is no grade associated. It for in their courses, and that's how the, we are able to get like, these high participation numbers. Um, as for the parts that we would change if we could start over, oh, I, I froze. Uh, okay, should I repeat the last one? Very good. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, those are the things that we are proud of. But of course, we also um, we could change things um, if we started over. Um, there is a recurrent trade-off in our mind always um, of breadth versus depth. Um, and we have been struggling with that a little bit. Um, do we want more data with less amount of detail or less data with lots of metadata associated with it? Um, so for example, when we started the corpus, um, we were asking less questions in the linguistic background questionnaire than the amount of questions that we have right now. Um, and we've noticed that since we added more questions, the participation has gone down a lot, actually. Um, participants don't, don't want to um, spend their time answering this uh, long questionnaire before they actually write. Um, so the ideal we have to, uh, to have chosen a strategy from the start uh, and follow that strategy from the beginning. Um, similarly, for each prompt, we have four quarters worth of data and we might not need that many. Maybe it would have been better to have more different prompts with less text for each of them. Um, and also, um, we would love to test the students on their proficiency before they write for, for Causal 2H, like for example, CEDEL 2 does. Um, but that, that would, of course, allow for easier and more accurate comparisons between learner corpora and also between students within a single course. In, um, here now at UC Davis. 
Um, however, this would also mean that participants um, would be, would be, um, sorry, I lost my notes, <laughs> would be um, more, um, we will be asking more of them um, to, to complete before, and we will have um, a less, um, less participation um, at the, a specific quarter and also uh, less retention for longitudinal data. And when we are really focusing on that longitudinal part, so, um, so we, they will be less prone to uh, keep participating quarter after quarter, um, which we would like them to do. Yeah, I think um, I think that's that's it for this question. Thank you, Paloma. So since we are extending ourselves a little more in this first question because there were three parts, what we'll do is we just skip the second one, right? So we finish this round and we go to the third question directly. Otherwise, we won't ever finish. But let's finish this first round with a lang snap. Uh, so Nicole, I'll pin you because right now it's Paloma who is pinned. All right, thanks everybody. Um, all right, can you see my screen? Yes, okay, perfect. Um, so LangSnap stands for the Languages and Social Networks Abroad Project. And this started as like a SLA study and we were interested in um, language learning during study abroad. And um, in the UK where this project started, Students there, if you're studying French or Spanish as your degree, you're required to study abroad. And so there's no like comparison group like we would have here in the US where some students don't have to go abroad to get their degree. So it's a longitudinal um, corpus and we started in 2011. And the first phase of the project went from 2011 to 2013. And that was the focus on language learning during study abroad. And then um, it's now since evolved to look at long-term retention of second languages. So uh, we have data that followed from in 2016, we collected more data and in 2019, and I'm gonna collect some this summer too. So we are continuing um, our project. And so I think I mentioned it, there's two second languages that we focus on here, Spanish is one, but also French. And so all our participants in both languages do the same tasks. Uh, we have oral and written data from the same participants. So we have an oral picture-based narrative, which is a pretty typical SLA type of um, task. We have an oral interview, which is semi-structured, which uh, we did with them. And because they are, were instructed learners getting their degrees in those languages, we wanted to have a sample of academic writing too. So we used an argumentative um, essay. And our corpus, I think now is somewhere around 750,000 words. It's primarily oral. I think it's close to like 90% oral language. And um, on this page, this is our project website from the first phase of the project, which talks about the, um, the let's see, the tasks, explains them a bit more. You can browse and download the data here. But I think, uh, in the future, we are primarily going to be using TalkBank, and we have the data from the initial, sorry, start of the project. Here you can see the French is separated on um, TalkBank, and the Spanish is down here. So we have the first phase of the project, and then this, the second one is called LangSnap 3.0 because it was three years after the, um, the first phase, and the next one is 6.0, and then the one I'm going to do the summer is 9.0, so that way we can kind of keep them separate. And so um, I believe those will be all here on TalkBank too on, as, as separate uh, little corpora. And um, let's see, because we got a grant for the first phase of the project, we really had to spend a lot of time thinking about the design and what we wanted, right? When you write a grant proposal, you're trying to make a strong case for the project you're doing. And that really forces you to think a lot and to also you know, argue for what you wanna do. So I think that was really important for us as far as you know, coming up with a design and what we wanted to include. Um, so what I really think is good is that we do have multiple sources of data from the same participant, which I think you know, is, is really important for looking at 
you know, vocabulary, for example, it, what you ask someone to do in an argument in an essay is really different than what they might do in an oral interview. And so when you have multiple sources, you really get a sense of what they're capable of doing. And also with grammatical features too, because certain tasks might not elicit specific grammatical features. And so what we tried to do, at least in our oral interview too, was to create questions that would elicit a lot of different types of grammatical features. Um, but we also used the information from the oral interview for more qualitative types of analyses too. Um, because we were trying to understand, at least on the first phase of the project, like what was contributing to their learning during a study abroad. And so the in oral interviews were a really important source of that um, information. Let's see. Um, yeah, we have the first phase of the project for the Spanish, I think we have 27 participants, which, you know, when you think about all these other corpora is not a lot. Right, but because you can follow our same participants over time, we have multiple sources of data, not just the corpus data. We have um, an elicited imitation test that they did where that we use as a measure of proficiency. We have a vocabulary test We have multiple types of questionnaires, and we're planning to make a lot of this publicly available too. right now. It's just been the corpus, but our plan is to add um, create like make those other sources of data available as well. Um, if we could redesign and do it again, <laughs> I think, it, you know, one of the benefits is long, of longitudinal research, what, which a lot of all these corpus creators have said, is like, later when you think about something, it's like, oh, okay, because we're still doing it, let's add that now, right? Like the metadata from the, um, the CALS project, like, that's really nice um, to be able to do that, too. Um, one thing, you know, because I come from an SLA perspective, Oftentimes I think, oh, I wish I had working memory data. For me, it's, it's more like these other measures that I want to have because I'm trying to understand like, you know, what's helping them learn or what's helping them maintain their, their skills, right? So for me, it's more these other SLA kind of control types of measures that I wish we had to. Um, so I think that's it for me at this point. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, so since we ran out of time, I mean, not out of time yet, but uh, what we will do is actually skip question two, we'll go to question three. And so basically question three is very briefly, maybe each of the corpus creator can mention, okay, what are your next steps? What are things you are excited about uh, with your corpus? And um, yeah, let's uh, proceed. So muscle corpus. Okay, um, so we're going to focus on uh, future plans then. Um, one of the things that we are currently doing or uh, planning to do is assigning unique identifiers to each student to allow for longitudinal analysis. Uh, currently, we do have um, this feature. I mean, we can use it ourselves, but it's not open to public. So we're going to add it to the public data so that everyone can do uh, like longitudinal analyses. And then um, we're planning to adding the immersion type information. So we had uh, two learning contexts, um, adult and child. And um, so they come from a one type, uh, sorry, one way immersion or a two way immersion, like meaning like uh, one group is only L2 speakers of that language and the other one is a mix of heritage speakers of that language and the L2 speakers of that language. And then also um, we're planning or hoping to add a built-in concordancer for online uh, analysis um, um, of muscle. And then um, also we are holding yearly workshops for DLI teachers starting this summer. And also um, another important plan is to create an OER or uh, open, um, open educational resource platform to provide public access to corpus informed materials uh, for um, DLI teachers. So um, basically we are, with those uh, workshops that I mentioned, uh, we are training teachers, DLI teachers to create um, corpus informed materials, like teach 
uh, we will teach them like how to use the corpus and uh, then uh, the outcome of the workshops will be um, materials that the teachers um, attending the workshops have uh, created and then uh, we're going to use part of that um, and um, you know share it with uh, everyone through an open educational resource um okay uh fernando would you like to add anything uh no just to emphasize that as claudia mentioned oh. at the beginning a lot of the um, um research that's being done on, on learners is um uh, with english learners there's not so much uh, i mean what we do what we all do is kind of exceptional so the connection between research and practice in languages other than english is lacking in some sense so as Elmas was saying uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is to connect what we are learning from the research that we're doing with the corpora to teaching practice. So we are building these open educational resources for learners of some of the languages that we're working with um, that are based on uh, corpus research. So corpus based uh, teaching materials. That's one of the things that I think we need to focus on moving forward. And may I have one last thing? Uh, so I tried to rush through the first question. So I didn't add a lot of details. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me in chat or um, email me. I will add my email there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, maybe at the at the end, we can share uh, with everybody, like everybody's links, everybody's emails, so that if anyone wants to contact any of the corpus creators, then they can do so. So let's, uh, let's plan on that. Thank you. Um, okay, so Cristobal. Yeah, um, I wanted to, to mention uh, some sort of uh, ideas for future directions and some things that we are also doing in the uh, Sedal to Corpus. Um, so my first uh, comment was uh, is connected to what Nicole was saying, actually. So apart from um, collecting basic, uh, you know, data from the learners, the, the linguistic profile that like their first language, the age, the age of onset, the length of exposure, or the length of residence, and so on. Um, we should also add or enrich, let's say, the corpora with the information coming from purpose-built questionnaires. The classic variable in there would be proficiency, right? So we typically administer a proficiency test, and then so we get information from their proficiency level. But what about memory? You know, we could administer like a memory uh, sort of, so, sort of, well, no questionnaire in this case, but a memory test, motivation, aptitude. What about long language dominance? Because sometimes we have to discard certain learners because, you know, you can see that they are more on the, you know, heritage speaker, you know, side of life than on the actual, you know, learner side of life. Uh, but if you administer, for example, a language dominance test, but, you know, at the end of the day, what you have is an index there of how dominant they are in, you know, in English or Spanish or in, in whatever two languages. Another observation has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, we should uh, invest time, yeah, and resources in training teachers, in this case, Spanish teachers, instructors, in, in how to use learner corpora, yeah, because learner corpora can be used in corpus-driven approaches to, to teaching. So this is this is very useful because I think of today, you know, we we end up creating very useful resources for researchers, but then, you know, the rest of the world does not know about it, and they are exploitable by by teachers and instructors. And regarding the future plans for Sedel Two, where we are expanding the corpus, we're incorporating different uh, new L ones, yeah like uh, Estonian, and I can see that uh, Virginia Rapun is, is here today with us. So she's in charge of the Estonian component. We have plenty of collaborators all over the world uh, helping in the data collection. Uh, L1 Polish, L1 Turkish, and recently L1 Vietnamese, and uh, there are, you know, uh, I'm negotiating other L1s with other uh, data collectors. Uh, also, we are very happy about our new uh, corpus called JFL Corp, Japanese Foreign Language Corpus, uh, whose you know director is here, Ignacio. I think you were there, right? Um, so this is an L2 Japanese corpus, okay? And the design is similar to uh, Sedel 2. And at the end of the day, what we want to make of Sedel 2 is a genuine bimodal corpus. So you know, we want data 
coming from the same learner, from the same task in spoken format. And then at least two weeks later, we collect, uh, sorry, in written format first, and then two weeks later, we do the, uh, the spoken task. And uh, a final observation, you know, for future research, which is something that I haven't seen in any corpus, is that, I mean, if, if you think about it, you know, when it comes to measuring the proficiency level, the corpus itself, what the learners produce is, <laughs> is the most valuable piece of information, isn't it? Yeah, so um, we could probably use like uh, uh, automatized metrics to measure, you know, the proficiency level of the learners or their, you know, lexical diversity, uh, syntactic uh, sophistication and, and so on. Okay, so this is something to, to think of. Obviously, this could be done by, uh, let's say, you know, examiners or something. So you can give the, pro you know, what the learners produce to, to a teacher or something, and they could rate the learners on a scale. So that would be another metric, actually, you know, a human metric of the proficiency level. So I think that this is an interesting avenue for future corpus research. And that's um, I was just going to interject real quickly, if you don't mind, uh, in regards to the uh, using of automated metrics for things like proficiency. That's actually something that we've been working on uh, extensively uh -huh. with uh, with Casal 2 h in terms of uh, analyzing things such as the um, lexical diversity, the error rates, um, and uh, developing automated tools like for example, we have a large portion of our corpus that's been error correct that's been corrected by instructors, um, mm -hmm. and oh, so wow. we're able to, we're able to use automated metrics to uh, analyze the progression of error rates across both in, in you know things like the differences between students uh, of different backgrounds as well as in the longitudinal data. So yeah, it's just an interesting point that you brought up automated metrics because it is something that we've been exploring quite extensively. Yeah. Right, that, that it's great to, to hear that because I know that there are plenty of people doing that for L2 English, <laughs> right? They are always yeah. like a, you know 10, 20 years ahead of us. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's interesting. Yeah, but very, very interesting, Sam. So thank you for pointing this out. Yeah. Of course. Well, welcome to Sam. It was cow's L2H uh, time anyway. So <laughs> thank you for <laughs> giving some information already. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, uh, then maybe Paloma has other things to add. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Because uh, yeah, the annotations was my last point, but but yeah, they're very important to to our corpus as well. Um, so the first one, I uh, the first thing I wanted to mention is that we've we've been thinking a lot about what the task or or, or the prompts of a learner corpus should and can look like. Um, so do we want to sample language that is as naturalistic as possible, like large uh, L1 corpora do? Um, well, with learner language, that is more difficult to do uh, or very difficult to do. Uh, for example, we can't simply pull out text from the internet because you can not tell who is a native speaker and who is an, an L2 or heritage speaker in the internet. Um, so for now, with Causal 2H, our solution has been to elicit our data using prompts that are as less constrained and specific as possible. So for example, we ask a, strict, a description of yourself or describe a, a famous person, tell us a terrible story. Um, and also to make the, the task not a part of the class environment, so uh, because students uh, could feel pressure to write in a certain way in the if they think that um, they are being graded or their structures will, will read the text. Um, on the same note, we see potential for learner corpora to include prompts that facilitate pragmatic analysis. For instance, in Causal 2H, uh, our tasks have traditionally been narrative and descriptive, but we are now adding um, email prompts in which participants have to make some kind of request but the recipient is different. It can be a professor or it can be a classmate. So what kinds of pragmatic devices will the learners use in each situation? Um, we also think that the field of Spanish learner corpus research has a lot to offer in terms of longitudinal research as we were talking about. Um, in Causal 2H, it is true that we don't have a proficiency test, but we do have a lot of contextual information uh, like the participants in structure, what they are learning in class at a specific point in the weeks that they are writing for the corpus, uh, the specific quarter that they are in. 
So we can see the evolution of a lot of learners as they progress through the Spanish language program and up to the upper division courses. Um, this can inform and actually is informing uh, curricular changes in our particular program. As for the for specific future plans we have for Council 2H, um, we are trying to increase participation in different ways because after the pandemic, extra credit hasn't been as much of an incentive anymore. Um, and we especially want to have more data from heritage speakers because we can't talk about Spanish in California or in UC Davis or, or in the US uh, without including this population. Um, we are also working on a reference corpus with the same prompts that we give the students. Um, and for that, we want to make sure that we include as many varieties, varieties of Spanish as possible, um, including Spanish in the US. Um, and also, um, as Sam was mentioning, we've been working with the University of Salamanca, a, a team of uh, professors and grad students there. Um, they've been working on annotating and correcting, uh, giving us corrected versions um, of the essays um, in Council 2H. Um, and the goal is to keep working on those and to have them completed for all texts and then to actually use the annotations for research uh, because we haven't uh, had a lot of time to um, use the annotations that we already have. We want to be done with all the annotations first. Um, and that brings us to the last thing I, I like to say about causal to each future. Uh, it is difficult to know when to stop collecting data. Uh, so at the moment we have like a lot of data that we haven't analyzed yet. And uh, it often feel, feels, as I was saying, that we can't keep up because every three months we have new data and we need to anonymize, uh, publish, annotate it. Um, so it's a recurring question, question in our minds, um, like is a corpus or in a corpus for general purpose like causal trade, when do you actually stop collecting this data? And when do you, yeah, it's, it's kind of sad <laughs> to think about, but yeah, when do you actually stop? <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a big question we have at the moment. Thank you, Paloma. And uh, Nicole? Yeah, I just wanted to start by saying, you know, we've all kind of been talking too about the limitations of our individual corpora, but the beauty of it is they're all shared publicly, right? So other people can use them. Other people can use them to, you know, pilot questions that they have and, and then if build another corpus. But by sharing it, we're really contributing um to to science to pushing it forward so i think it's wonderful and it, it is a lot of time and dedication right that we we all spend and a lot of money and and students involved and colleagues and you know it it is it's a big endeavor right all of these projects are really big and involve a lot of people um for our project for Langsnap, I'm really excited by the new phase where we're looking at long-term retention because there's very little research on, on that. And there's a little bit of research on like second language attrition, but really I think that's an important question to think about, you know, a lot of us study other languages and then we kind of stop, right? So then what happens to those language skills? And so that's something I'm really excited about to see if our project can contribute to understanding that better. Um, something that I, you know, I think I hope we start seeing in more learner corpora are like informal conversations. We had some of our participants in Langsnap record themselves with friends. And I like, we have so much data that I finally just got that transcribed like a year or so ago and haven't had a chance to even look at it to like try to share it or do any analysis on it whatsoever. Um, but I do think that would be another interesting type of language sample to have. I mean, you see this in, in like the BNC, the British National Corpus, for example, they have informal conversations. And, and I think that's an important register to include. So hopefully we will um, see more of those. And then we can compare, you know, what do our students do actually when they're talking to same age peers, or if they're talking to a, you know, an L1 speaker, you know, do they change the way they talk or the words they use, or are they less, are they more disfluent? Like I think I am, right? If I speak Spanish with a native speaker, my monitor's on and I'm really like worried about making mistakes, right? So I probably am more disfluent than I am with somebody else. So anyway, that's it. Okay, thank you so much. So just uh, because we've mentioned a couple things, uh, 
So Nicole is going to be presenting at 11 uh, for those who are in Davis at the community center, but those who are online, it's the same link, right? Um, so you can just uh, follow the talk online. Uh, and then also we will have the team. So Carmela, Tome, and Natividad Hernandez Muñoz will be presenting on the corpus annotation efforts that, that they've been working on with us from the University of Salamanca. So that will give kind of follow up on some stuff that's come up um, today. So now is the time for questions. You can share them uh in the chat or just unmute yourself um i don't know anyone wants to uh start has any question comments uh things they've been thinking about as they heard everyone else uh talk yeah sophia yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for such interesting um, presentations of your corpora. I was really curious, um, this is a question to Elnaz and Fernando, about um, your use of the ACTFL and um, the OPIC exams. So I'm curious, you know, how you made the decision to use those exams, um, what maybe some advantages and well, I guess um, in terms of the challenge of how long it can take to administer some of the exams um, and then kind of, I guess, you know, if you have time to answer this, but um, would you recommend other corpora to use that? I know it can be very expensive. So it sounds like getting a grant that's specific for using um, those tests is probably most useful. So just some commentary on using those exams. Unless you want me to. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, great. So the, the adult data um, that's part of our corpus comes from um, OPIs that were administered as part of, of a large um, grant that we received a couple of years ago um, to uh, assess proficiency of students in a variety of languages at the university level across the country. So we did not have to administer the tests. I mean, we did, but we didn't have to pay for them or anything. They're, they're expensive um, and, and time consuming, um, but it was part of a grant already. We had access to the data and we thought, let's use it. Um, with the children data, it's a similar process. The state of Utah um, has, um, I think the largest um, state run dual language immersion program in the country. We have about 40,000, actually close to 50,000 students that are participating in, in this program and get tested by the state every year. So we, we get access to those tests. It's 50,000 tests that we get access to every year. When Paloma was talking about when to say enough is enough, I was thinking, yes, you're absolutely right. That's, that's, a, that's a good question. So those tests are, are already administered. The students take, take those tests anyway. We have access to the data. We take it, we use it. But um, would I recommend other people to do the same? I don't know. It's expensive. I mean, if, if you have the funds to do it, it's nice to have someone else rate the students and have some form of external validated uh, certified rating. Um, but it's not easy to do unless you have the funds to do it. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I mean, at least us, we've been struggling a bit with the proficiency end of things because it's it just like for us, since we are a university, as Paloma said, like we use the course as the indicator of the level of the students. And then we have some sort of approximation of, okay, like Spanish one is an A1 in the CFR. But then of course, like students in the in each of the classes will vary a lot. Like we have students who are false beginners, students who are real beginners. And, and so that's really something like how to find a proficiency test that's kind of common across corpora maybe so that we can more easily compare our participants. That's maybe something that we'll, we'll have to discuss, uh, keep discussing uh, in the future, right? Any other questions or comments? Yes, Olga. Um, 
since uh, you you were talking about the need to to have a proficiency level, why um, can't the text be uploaded to the automated systems of uh, a device like like those for learners? Write and improve gives some prediction. Um, uh, if 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 you take those predictions from say three platforms, um, you get you can work out how they kind of um, correlate and then have one one prediction for the text, especially if you have uh, long enough texts and not just one. It also takes time, but uh, you don't have to pay. Um, a lot of money to get automated predictions. What? Where am I wrong? Tell me. Anyone wants to respond? I see Nicole smiling, but if you have to the spot. Oh, this is connected to the uh, to the issue I was bringing up, and uh, that Sam Davidson uh, commented upon. Um, I mean, the idea is that if we have the learners' texts, you know, that's the best evidence you know uh, of their proficiency level so i mean the the idea is that perhaps we shouldn't stick to only one measure or one metric of proficiency level one metric is you know the standard uh you know placement test yeah uh for example we also collect the data uh, you know from their uh, self-proficiency so they rate themselves on a six-point scale on each of the skills speaking listening rating and so on yeah um, so an additional measure could be the score given, I mean, if you can afford it, you know, the score given by, uh, you know, exam markers, let's say, yeah. And other metrics could be, you know, automatic metrics. And then within the range of automatic metrics, I mean, there are different metrics, you know, having to do with a lexicon, whatever. So I think that this is a very interesting, an interesting move. So, you know, to have, let's say, uh, a rich set of different metrics, like subjective, objective metrics, so that we have a fully rounded picture of each participant, of each learner. I think that would be ideal, but that's expensive and time consuming, of course. I mean, yeah, yeah. there's always a trade off between, you know, how much information you want per participant and uh, how much time and money you can afford. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, it kind of goes back to the breadth and depth. It's like if you get tons of participants, of course, you can only ask them like a few questions. If you get few participants, then you can like ask them more questions and keep track of them more easily. And it's kind of, yeah, like where I, it, it goes back to where do you stop? It's like, do you are you happy with just fewer participants, but getting way more information about each of them? Or like, do you go bigger, but then you have less information? And about the text test, so about the proficiency test, since our corpus is really based on one institution, what we are kind of dreaming about is like, maybe in the future, we can stop using the placement test that we have, because like the placement tests that we currently use are like uh, grammar tests, it's the web cape, I don't know. It's like just one of these that you pay for as a university and then uh, it doesn't really correspond to anything that we do in the classroom. It just like, like places according to like a score, but it's kind of really not, yeah, it doesn't correspond to anything real actually. And so we've been thinking like, what if we could actually do exactly that, use the corpus, like have students write to one of the prompts and then find what their level is by comparison with all the students at that level that we've been like, um, um, yeah, who've written to the corpus. And since we have like quite a few, um, that could be a way to go. We are not there yet, but definitely working towards it. Um, yeah, I also wanted to mention that uh, when we are trying to use these automatic measures like lexical diversity, um, you have to be careful um, on, the, on the topics, on the, on the prompts that you are uh, comparing. Um, because we've, we've done uh, some studies with that because we have um, these prompts that are very positive, like write a wonderful story, uh, and these prompts that are very um, negative, write a terrible story. 
and we've compared um, the lexical diversities for each of the levels uh, or the courses um, for these positive and negative prompts. And we've seen that the lexical diversity, this single measure um, of uh, how varied the vocabulary in a text is, can be very different um, and it's actually significantly 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 sorry uh, higher in um, positive uh, valence tests than in negative valence tests. So if we are comparing uh, some corpus that have prompts that may, may maybe be like more neutral or more negative than uh, other prompts in another corpus that can be more positive, then we have a problem because they are, uh, with these automatic measures, you can't really compare them that way. You have to be careful with the, with the topic of the essay. Yeah. True. There are also task effects that are gender-based. Um, and with our corpus, we've seen that depending on the prompt, that the students get some prompts elicit a lot more language from female students than male students and others do the opposite. So you gotta be careful with that too. Yeah, I think in a sense that comes back to the idea of having multiple measures instead of only one, right? Like if you only use lexical diversity from one text that doesn't work, but if you have that and then the self like proficiency assessment plus some other measures and you combine them together, there is a better chance that we get to something that's a little bit more like a good indicator of um, students' proficiency to compare across corpora, right? I just want to jump in and say, these are excellent sort of methodological papers in the works, right? So <laughs> a lot of journals now are welcoming those types of publications. The International Journal, journal of Learner Corpus Research has that as one area. So, you know, these are important topics that, yeah, should be published, should should be out there for other people to, to learn from. Um, and there's a new journal on research methods and applied linguistics. I think that would be another good place to send these out. So take the time to do those kinds of papers too. Yes, thank you. Yeah, this is really encouraging. And I feel like we've all touched on several things. So definitely the proficiency end, but I've also heard, like, I think all of us are struggling with the kind of metadata, or we could call them otherwise, but like, what do we include there? I think uh, Nicole's idea of including like working memory or other types of um, tests, but we, we've also been really interested in everything that has to do with emotions and motivations, how that could also influence uh, what's going on, or like the interviews you are doing with Langsnap, all that really gives like really contextualize whatever is in the corpus by providing more and more information as we can get. So I think that's really something that's in everybody's mind. And then the other thing that I've really heard everybody touch on a little bit is the idea that we need also longitudinal data, right? We are all um, making efforts to find ways to, um, to do that. So I think that's really um, encouraging. But we will have to stop now because we have another session starting in 15 minutes in the same link. So, I mean, you can stay or come back in 15 minutes. Um, and thank you so, so much for everyone uh, who presented today. This was really, really interesting. I think it's, it's so cool to be able to talk to other people and see that we, we have like similar like things that are worrying us or that we are wondering how to do. So I think this conversation should continue further. And if uh, we have a Discord channel, I'm not such a techie yet, but like apparently it's a thing. So let's uh, share the link so that anyone who wants to chat with other people on the Discord channel um, can do so to continue conversations. And as I said, I will also share in an email to the participants today um, the links and emails uh, of the corpus um, corpora that we talked about here. So yeah, thank you very much. And feel free to stay and uh, see you 